Okay, thanks. Thanks for the introduction and thank you everyone for coming. As Nick's uh, made clear to you, um, I'm presenting on my PhD research, which concerns reef fish spawning aggregations. So without further ado, this is a reef fish spawning aggregation of the snapper, the Janus Bonaparte. And obviously, <coughs> for fishermen, this is like finding a gold mine in many ways. And many reef fish do this behavior. They aggregate for the purpose of spawning often migrating from a home range reef to a specific spawning site at a specific time to engage in spawning. And, you know, so this behavior is very predictable to fishers. <coughs> and a failure to account for this behavior and how fishers interact with this behavior has led to the collapse of some notable uh, stocks around the world, not just in reef fish, but in temperate uh, fisheries as well. Um, so really, the species that exhibit this behavior, we have to consider the implications of it, assessing and managing those fisheries. So my PhD aims to understand the sources of vulnerability to fishing and reef fishes that aggregate this morning. Now there is a, a global database on uh, reef fish spawning aggregation status, um, which um, shows that the status is highly variable among spawning aggregations globally. So we see that the, the largest number assessed showing a decreasing trend, some increasing, some the same. But what you notice is that huge black bar at the top, saying that really we don't un, uh, know the status of many spawning aggregations globally. Um, and that highlights the data poor context of many coral reef fisheries. Also, not shown in the graph, but when you look into that data, you find that the status is highly variable within and between countries as well. So that leads us to, to question, to what extent do aggregating species vary in their vulnerability to fishing, and what are some of the sources of that variation? And in a fishery science um, framework, we can consider vulnerability in terms of two components. We consider the vulnerability intrinsically, so what is the rate that populations will recover following depletion due to fishing or to many other factors that cause depletion? And we also consider the, uh, the extrinsic vulnerability. To what extent is a population exposed to a fishery? Uh, to what extent is the fishery interacting with that population. And together we can combine those two to define vulnerability to fishing. So I've used this also as a conceptual research framework, and these data poor uh, approaches um, are becoming quite popular now. Typically, we don't know what the rate of population increase is. Um, it's only after a, a, some very good uh, fisheries data, typically independent or dependent, that we know that. And we don't know what the exposure is to a fishery in terms of catch in many coral reef systems. There aren't the monitoring systems in place to know that. So we have developed, or uh, many uh, scientists have developed this data poor framework where we replace these, these uh, parameters with indicators or proxies uh, of those uh, extrinsic and intrinsic vulnerability. But I'm interested in aggregating behavior. And to date, there have been no attempts to define aggregating behavior in terms of indicators and to, if you like, to decompose it, to break it up, and to see in what ways does that aggregating behavior confer vulnerability to fishing. <coughs> and I'm particularly interested in how that aggregating behavior exposes a population to a fishery, or doesn't, as the case may be. So just looking at this axis in a bit more detail, obviously, when we're dealing with uh, many of the species that aggregate this morning, we have to consider life history. At, at the top there is a small rabbit fish, which aggregates, and then the giant grouper. And as you can see, vastly different growth parameters, the rate at which they grow. So of course, we have to incorporate life history into any attempt to understand what makes these species vulnerable to fishing. But what I'm particularly interested in is the aggregation of density. And this is in terms of the magnitude of density change. So solitary groupers, for example, um, when they aggregate this morning, the density change in the population is huge, uh, many thousands of times greater densities. Uh, but in some of the more social species that are spawning for non-reproductive functions, the density change may be less. I'm interested in the, the number of spawning sites. Uh, those with fewer spawning sites tend to have larger density changes. And then things like the frequency, how often are they aggregated, uh, and the duration of those aggregations are also important. So my PhD is focusing very much on this. Um, life history is, of course, important. And when I assess multiple fisheries using a framework at the end, Life history, of course, comes back in. But in terms of density, this is something 
which was uh, the major focus of the PhD. Now, the density change defines Hawking aggregation. So if it doesn't involve a change density, it's not an aggregation. Simple as that. Um, but really, density operates through this parameter here known as catchability. So catchability uh, is a parameter which defines the proportion of a population caught by a single unit of effort. And you can see here from the catch equation at the top that really it's the combination of catchability with fishing effort and the stock abundance which determines catches and fishing mortality rates. And it's often assumed by rearranging this equation that if catchability is constant, therefore CPU, CPUE is an indicator of abundance. The problem is, is catchability is highly variable, so CPUE very rarely serves as a robust indicator of population abundance. And what we also find in a, in a review uh, by Wilberg um, is that if catchability is varying, a, a, a major reason for that is density dependence. Now, obviously, um, stocks don't occur, or populations uh, don't occur at the same density throughout their range. There's high density areas, low density in space all the time. And if you're fishing on a high density area, you can obviously remove a much larger proportion of the population than you're fishing in a low density area. So, in looking at what causes catchability to vary, density dependence often comes out very much top. But there's an assumption that these density changes with aggregation formation translates to a change in uh, into vulnerability. But it's rarely tested empirically for spawning aggregation fisheries. Now, what um, extrinsic factors could we consider as exposing populations or exposing aggregations to a fishery? Obviously, we need to have fisher knowledge. If fishers don't know where the aggregations are, it's going to be very difficult for them to exploit them. So that seems to be key. They must have the technology to exploit those aggregations. They must have the right gears that can uh, efficient, efficiently exploit them. They must be able to access the spawning aggregation sites. Some of them occur very far away or they're very deep. And of course there must be markets. Uh, there must be demand for those species. And there must be the ability to absorb often quite large catches that come in a very short time frame from fishing on aggregations. And of course, the management regime is going to be important as well. We need to consider whether the aggregations are in any way managed or the fisheries that exploit them. Now, the first three factors are really important to understand in that they, if you look through the literature and the fishery science um, assessment, the models, these are the things that are really influencing catchability. So as well as density change, it's these three things that can have a major influence. Whereas markets management <coughs> and to an extent accessibility determine the fishing effort. Now another focus of my PhD is on fisher knowledge and the reasons that we'll see. The role of fisher knowledge in conferring vulnerability, obviously spawning aggregation is a very transient phenomenon. They don't stay in the same place, they, they form and they disperse. So fishers need to have good knowledge on their timing and location. Now, in looking in Papua New Guinea across most provinces in Papua New Guinea, uh, Richard Hamilton from TNC found that there's a huge variation in knowledge in that country, and that he, he proposed that that was the major source of variable exploitation status. And he attributed that variation in knowledge to things like tenure, dependency on fishing gear factors, but these were not quantified in terms of their effects on fish knowledge. So there was a, re a research gap identified in that the lack of quantitative evidence on the role that fish and knowledge plays in the development of an aggregation fishery. So now I'd like to uh, come back to my research questions. As you can see, I've populated the, the, the framework with the, so the indicators that I've just discussed. And in chapter one, two, and three, I'm very much exploring how aggregation density and these extrinsic indicators are influencing catchability their interaction. In chapter four, which I don't have time to present today, uh, I showed that catchability and the ratio of catchability from spawning to non-spawning sites has a major influence, more so than life history, more so than sex change, um, on the effects of marine reserves for, you, uh, for protecting spawning aggregations. In chapter five, for which I'll present preliminary results today, we're bringing all this together and assessing a global set of spawning aggregation fisheries using expert interviews. So first, starting in chapter one, this is where I'm looking at what, uh, how fish knowledge varies. 
how it can be perhaps explained by socioeconomic or institutional factors, and how it leads to targeting. So obviously this extrinsic index that we've developed is highly de dependent on fish knowledge. Um, sources of variation of fish, fish knowledge are therefore important in understanding the role that fish knowledge plays in development of the spawning aviation fisheries. But obviously the density changes that are occurring um, in these species vary enormously. You've got groupers that are otherwise solitary. When they form spawning aggregations, there's a huge change in density. You've got snappers which are aggregating for non-reproductive purposes. Um, so there's not so much of a change in density when they form spawning aggregations. And you've got emperors that are somewhere in between these extremes. Now for this uh, study, I went to Papua New Guinea and I looked at two uh, locations, Ahas Island and Kapa Island. And in each of those locations, I did interview-based surveys with fishermen, uh, 32 fishers at the locations. And the reason why these sites were selected is they really do represent the extremes of knowledge variation observed by Hamilton, which I'll, I'll demonstrate. And the questions I was looking, uh, wanted to know was how does knowledge vary among these different fish taxa and these locations? And I uh, interviewed fishers about their knowledge on seven attributes of aggregating behavior. The location, size, timing, mobility, and function of those aggregating groups. And I also wanted to know how that knowledge varied in relation to socioeconomic and institutional indicators. So I looked at socioeconomic variables, uh, access to species habitat and gears, which is often clan or related to tenure, uh, gender dependency on fishing, and uh, collected information on CPUE, fishing effort, and markets. So just to highlight these major socioeconomic differences, Karkar is a, is a very high volcanic island, rich uh, in agricultural uh, potential, and so fishers are not so dependent on fishing in that island, um, and expend less fishing efforts. Whereas Manus, I, uh, sorry, Arvis Island off the north coast of Manus, fishing is a primary livelihood. It's a small coral uh, uh, reef, uh, or a small coral island with a huge reef lagoon, and fishing is, is the major livelihood. So in terms of these different attributes of aggregating behavior that I interviewed fishers about, I scaled fishing knowledge in relation to those, and then I statistically examined how knowledge varied between Aarhus and Karkar for each of those attributes, and for each of those taxa. And what we find is that for the grouper and the two emperors that are at the top there, is those top three rows, is that in all, on all of the attributes that I asked fishers about, it was the fishermen on Aarhus that had far more precise knowledge Whereas for the bottom three species, which is a grouper and the two snappers, um, we found that the knowledge was equally developed or equally uh, precise, if you like, but I didn't test that decision. But it, they were, had knowledge on, on many of those uh, attributes equally across Arthas and Carter. So we see this. But if the knowledge of aggregating behavior is equivalent in Arthas and Carter for that bottom three species, does this mean these species are equally vulnerable to fishing in those two locations? And what we find, by using this species as an example, is when we ask fishermen about their catch rates, their CPUE, that the only significant difference between those locations was for this snapper, where Aarhus fishers report huge catch rates that they get for the snapper. Um, and they, they achieve those very high catch rates by innovating their gears available to them. So they use scare lines and they use nets to corral these non-reproductive uh, aggregations of this snapper into nets where they target them with spears. So it's, in a way, it's a form of mur murawami fishing. Um, now, they've developed this at Arhus, but not at Karkar. So why is that? Is it because in Karkar they're more dependent on fishing? Possibly. Um, but it means that they're achieving much higher CPUE. So the knowledge of the aggregating behavior, even though it's shared between those communities, may not lead to the development of an aggregation fishery, as we see in Karkar. It may not. So I also then looked at the socioeconomic uh, variables. So for each species, I combined attributes to create a fish knowledge in index. I used redundancy analysis to uh, explore relation of this fish knowledge index with socioeconomic and institutional variables. And RDA is a form of ordination and, and regression techniques. And we find for Aarhus that basically the uh, groups of fishers have very detailed knowledge on the two groupers and one of the emperors there, which is 
to the left on component one. Um, then you had the other emperor sort of in between, component one and two on the other side. And the snappers are sort of falling on component two in between. And when we look at <coughs> the significant socioeconomic variables, we find it's largely related to, uh, to tenure at, at Aarhus. So male fishers who can access the outer reefs, uh, well, all habitats in the reef system, have developed very uh, precise knowledge on aggregating behavior in the groupers and the, the emperor on the left. Whereas female fishers who were restricted to fishing in the lagoon with nets had developed very detailed knowledge on the aggregated behavior of the and Sarak on the right over there. Um, and that's consistent with what we know about the biology and the behavior of those species. Um, what we find, I'm not going to show the RDA for Karka in the interest of time, but we find that knowledge was much more homogenous in Karka. Their access is less restricted by clan to either habitats or gears. So you find that knowledge is shared more widely amongst fishermen at the island. Although we did find that the fishers at Karka that are using spears were the ones that had knowledge of group of spawning aggregations. So, and that makes sense in that they're in the water observing um, what's happening. And empirically, what we're finding with this analysis is it's largely confirming what Hamilton proposed were the reasons for the variation in knowledge in, in Papua New Guinea. So to conclude, knowledge of aggregating behavior was structured by 10-year gear use dependency on fishing. Uh, it, very importantly, knowledge of aggregating behavior may not act as a precursor for the development of an aggregation fishery. So it hasn't uh, in the case of the snapper at Karkar, but it has at Ahas. And also that fisheries can develop to exploit non-reproductive aggregations. It's not just spawning aggregations that are vulnerable to fishing. Turning now to chapter two. In chapter two, I'm now focusing more on uh, the aggregation sites themselves and fisheries that are exploiting those aggregations, and I'm observing those in situ. So here we're looking at single species aggregation fishery and asking, does vulnerability depend on the changes in density in that fishery or other factors? <coughs> As I mentioned, density change defines spawning aggregation. So the density, the spawning density and the non-spawning density should be significantly different if it's an aggregation. But this ratio um, of densities is not quite so important as understanding what the, the ratio of catchability is. So how much more vulnerable does spawning behavior or how much more exposed to the fishery does spawning behavior make that, uh, that population? And this is what's really important as a fisheries management uh, parameter. And you know, just to demonstrate that, some of the work that I've been doing in parallel to this PhD has shown that marine reserve outcomes are highly sensitive to this, this ratio of QS and QNS, to the extent that they override the importance of life history factors or uh, uh, sex uh, change and so on. So just returning to our framework to see where we are, here in this chapter we're looking very much at the, the role of aggregation density and how that's influenced by fish and knowledge, technology, and accessibility. So in this one, I went to Seychelles, uh, where I live, so I went home. Uh, this is uh, Siganus sutor, a rabbit fish. And Siganus sutor is fished in this non-spawning habitat, because the fringing carbonate reef, most of the time. Um, but <laughs> over uh, six to seven months, the fishery and the fishermen migrate to the spawning site, which is some four kilometers away from the reef. This is actually just one of about eight spawning sites we know in this, in this area. So I worked with fishermen, uh, two fishermen, who have been in this fishery for more than 10 years, and were exploiting both these habitats. I recorded their catch, their fishing effort, for which I estimated their catch per unit effort. And I, at each site that they fished, either spawning site or individual sites within the, the, the non-spawning habitat, I did diver-operated video surveys so that I could get an estimate of population density. So and this was done 20 minute time swim, uh, time swims. From this I got two density metrics, max n, which is the maximum number of that species observed in any of the frames in that 20 minute swim. And then the presence, the percentage of sample frames from the video that had this fish um, in the frames. And then I also, in, in addition to these density metrics, I wanted to explore some of the other factors that may be causing catchability or vulnerability to vary in this fishery. Turning first to the density metrics, we find that you know, presence as a metric is on the top and max n is on the bottom graph. And we find that there's similarities there. So 
Um, uh, the density is nine times less in the case of the presence and 13 times less than spawning in the case of Maxen. So there's a clear increase in, in density when this species aggregates for spawning. Um, between 9 and 13 times. So you would expect if density dependence or density dependent processes are operating, that the ratio of densities that we're seeing there would be reflected in the ratio of the CPUE between the spawning and the non-spawning sites. What we actually find, though, is that the ratio of CPUE across of the, those two habitats is only a, roughly a four-fold difference. So rather than a 9 to 13-fold difference, it's only four-fold. Um, so, and also the other thing to note is that spawning CPU is highly variable. Often, they, what well, they are statistically getting as many zero sets in the spawning site as when they're in the non-spawning site. But in terms of the positive sets where there is catch, it's a four-fold difference. Uh, but it's ranging from zero up to something like 60 fish per trap hour, trap fishing hour. Um, but that, those peaks in spawning tended to occur in certain months in spawning CPU. Whereas in other months, they were not that different from non-sporting or other periods. So we have to just go back. What factors could be causing the depression of CPU at the spawning site? So we explore some of those. I formed boosted regression trees, um, which is a machine learning tool that produces many different trees using various combinations of explanatory variables in an attempt to reduce uh, the deviance um, in the model. The final model, um, using cross-validation, explain about 40% of the deviance. And it also, this method splits the data into sort of training, or sort of, uh, you know, the, the, the data it uses to build the model, and then holds out a testing set of data at random. And we find a correlation between those testing data set and the actual data at 0.61. So quite correlated. We find, using variable importance scores, which is the number of times an explanatory variable appears in the regression trees, we find that we've got really three groups uh, of variables. And the top three is what I'll focus on, except I won't show depth, because all depth explains is that the CPU side is, is the spawning side is deeper and CPU is higher. So I'll look at presence and currents in terms of partial plots. And first of all, we're looking at, so this is fitted CPU or model CPU against uh, presence. And we find this strong step in presence is occurring typically at the spawning site when presence is greater than 25% in those sample frames. So it's picking, the, it's, 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 it's fitting to this strong step, um, but we have to realize that there is this weak density dependence and that when presence was high in certain periods, it didn't result in high catch rates. But what potentially may explain some of that is that really what we're finding is that CPUE is really peaking when the current strengths of the site are very strong. And as you can see, here on the left, you have huge trap densities at the spawning site. And of course, they're sending off bait plumes in all directions that are overlapping potentially spatially uh, uh, in distinct bait plumes. And that very strong currents enable the fish, or make it easier for the fish to find the entrance to the traps. So, and this, in a way, ties in what fishermen tell us, is that they need very strong currents at the site to be able to get these very high catch rates. So this is potentially explaining the weak density dependence. So just to conclude, the vulnerability to spawning aggregation to fishing is highly variable on seasonal scales, with environmental conditions, potential currents, likely to influence catchability in baited gear fisheries. That's potentially why you're seeing weak density dependence. So this density ratio is not necessarily a proxy for a change in vulnerability to, caused by aggregating behavior, because there are many other factors that can cause catchability to vary. Turning now to chapter three, here is where we can look at uh, a multi-species group of spawning aggregation site and look at aspects, uh, uh, aspects of fish and fisher behavior and how that influences vulnerability to fishing. So in this, uh, just to explain a bit behind this, so in the previous chapter, we were looking at the density changes between the non-spawning habitat and the spawning habitat. Now we're looking at the density changes that occur within at the spawning site itself. And the density changes for these groupers can be particularly extreme. You know, that two weeks before spawning, there's, not, there's none there. And then very quickly, the number of groupers start to increase. Around, or sometimes about a week before the spawning, you get a real peak as the females come into the site in these sex-changing species. So you've got these huge gradients in density occurring. But not only have you got that variation for one species, 
but these are often multi-species all of a sudden. So spatially and temporally overlapping, you will have sometimes up to uh, three or four species of groupers aggregating at the same site. Now, obviously, there's going to be interactions among these species for baited gear. Some are going to be better competitors than others. So just returning to our framework, here again we're looking at this interaction of aggregation density, and this time particularly in terms of technology and accessibility. So for this study, I was in, back in Papua New Guinea, um, in Jowl Island, where I observed an aggregation fishery for these two species of groupers, and recording the cat fishers catch effort, uh, CPUE. Um, I also did UVC surveys every day on this, in these aggregations to get an estimate of relative aggregation abundance, which is really because it was spatially defined as actually a density measure rather than absolute aggregation abundance. And from that, we can calculate our catchability parameter um, and look at changes in that. <coughs> so the key questions I've tried to answer in this chapter, are species equally vulnerable to the gear in this fishery? You know, and I'm comparing CPUE and catchability. I'm asking, is CPUE of these species in any way related to the size of their aggregations? You know, a, a conventional wisdom tells us we can use CPUE to monitor, to monitor the, uh, the abundance. But I'm asking if it's not related to abundance, what other aspects of fish or fisher behavior influence CPUE? And in this case, I'm looking at the abundance of other species at the spawning site, the other species, the density of fishermen at the site. How many fishermen are in that, on that trip to that spawning site at any particular time? What's their density of fishermen across the spawning site? And I'm looking at things like fishing depth and hook size. What we find is that over the two months, average across the two months, the Abundance, aggregation abundance for these two groupers was exactly the same. There was no difference in size between those aggregations, average over months. But what we find is that from the polyphicabian, which is uh, the one there, we're finding that the CPUE was some tenfold greater than the CPUE for the other species. And when we estimate the catchability, which obviously accounts for those differences, slight differences in abundance at any particular time, we find, again, still an eightfold difference in the vulnerability of this species to being caught than this species. So quite clearly, this uh, polyphicanian is far more aggressive towards bait, baited lines than the other species, or can outcompete uh, the other species in terms of motivation for feeding uh, and those other factors which affect uh, feeding rates in fish. So clearly there's a, there's a big difference there in vulnerability to the gear. When we look at how the CPUE of each of those species relates to the size of their aggregations, we don't see there's really any relationship. A slight negative trend uh, in this species, but not really explaining very much of the variation. Um, but what we see, basically, is that for this species, polyphicadian, that when the aggregation is only 25 fish, or very small, they could be catching as, they could, the CPUE could be as high as when there's 220 fish there. So really, CPUE has shown no relationship to abundance at all. So this appears to be an example of an extreme form of CPUE hyperstability. And hyperstability is defined or occurs when CPUE only starts to decline at very low levels of abundance. So for, uh, if, you're, if you're using CPUE as an indicator or if you're a fisherman perceiving your catch rates, you think there's many fish there because your CPUE rates are not changing, when in fact the aggregation is diminishing in size. So it creates this illusion of plenty, where we really don't see the changes going on in the abundance. Um, but whereas CPUE hyperstability can occur with density dependence in this fishery, we find some other factors that may be responsible for causing that hyperstability. So to look at what those factors might be causing hyperstability are, we did generalize, I did generalized linear models um, on each of the CPU on the CPU for each of these species. And what we find is that for Fusco batatas, what's really influencing the CPUE is the abundance of the other species, which makes sense. Um, and then for polyphicadian, it's effort density. And I'll explain that through the partial plot. So for Fusco batatas, what we see is that as the aggregation size of the other species increases, the CPUE of this one declines quite, quite a lot. And that makes sense. The other species is more competitive for the bait. So if, if there's more of them there, they will stop the other species 
uh, from being, or prevent the other species from being caught. So, but this highlights the potential for sequential fishing effects. As long as the other species, Polycanian, is there, then this species, Muscovitatus, is not particularly vulnerable to fishery. But of course, as you fish down the other species, and you over overfish it, then this one starts then to become more vulnerable to the gear. <coughs> also, of course, if you bring in a new gear, which is more selective for that species, that changes the story again. So we must consider these effects when we think about how we would manage these aggregation fisheries. For polyphacadian, what we find is that CPUE declines uh, with the density of fishermen at the site. So the more fishermen you put at that spawning site on a trip, the less, the lower their catch rates are. And the likely mechanism for this is gear saturation. Just as we saw in the other chapter, the more and more bait you put into the water, the more and more trouble fish have in locating the source of those that scent from the bait. Plus, you may get interference with fishermen tangling their lines or knocking each other in their boats, and which was happening at that site at particular times uh, where the density is so high. But of course, this also has implications for management, because if your intention is to reduce fishing mortality by lowering the level of effort or number of fishermen, it will have unintended consequences. Because as you reduce the number of fishermen, the catch rates go up, and they can actually catch the same as when you have multiple fishermen. So we see here, just one example, that five fishermen on one trip that were there at the site caught as many, uh, or in summer, uh, on another trip, they caught more fish than when 19 fishermen were fishing at the site. So limiting the, the fishing effort does not necessarily reduce the catch or the mortality of those aggregation spawners. So to conclude, these multi-species spawning aggregations are common, particularly amongst the groupers. Um, and species vulnerability to fishing will be influenced by gear selectivity and competition among species for bait. So, the, and that, so therefore, the density increase with aggregation formation does not confer vulnerability to fishing if catchability is low in the presence of other aggregating species. So we see there the interaction between the fishery and the density changes. Um, which I set out to explore in this PhD. CPUE is clearly not proportional to aggregation abundance. It's exhibiting hyperstability. It's remaining stable regardless of the aggregation size. So clearly it should not be used. Um, and it's not just should not be used by scientists. The fishermen are the ones perceiving CPUE as well in terms of how they uh, look at the status of the fishery. But this, obviously, both these findings have implications for management. We need to consider sequential fishing effects and we need to consider, consider that reducing uh, fishing effort or controlling fishing effort does not control fishing mortality in this fishery. So in the last chapter, um, I'm then looking now not at one or two species, but I'm looking at many species on a global set of aggregation fisheries. And I do have to apologize. I feel like I've been building up to this, but all you're going to see today is very preliminary results, because this is the one I still have to do some more, uh, quite a bit more analysis on. Um, so what we're doing is seeing whether we can develop this bivariate framework and can it predict the vulnerability of these aggregations to, to a fishery. So just reiterating that these, these fisheries are very data poor. In these frameworks, um, the distance to any point in the framework, the Euclidean distance, can therefore be used or considered a, uh, a measure of, of vulnerability to fishing. What I did, though, is I took all of those indi indicators that I've been showing you uh, the, the, as we go through, and informed by the findings, as you can see in green, some of them have direct uh, relation to the preceding chapters. But where I didn't have that, I've obviously gone to the literature. Um, I developed those indicators into sub-indicators, if you like, breaking it down. And I've scaled those from low to high vulnerability, again, informed by my chapters or by the literature. And I've then put that into an interview type survey and I've then spoken to experts in spawning aggregation fisheries around, around the, the, the tropics. And um, so I contacted these experts, they agreed to be interviewed, and we went through all of these different indicators on vulnerability to fishing and they scale and they scored those on those scales. And in total it was 39 fisheries <coughs> across 16 countries. I didn't visit all those countries, it was all done by staff. So here is just the very first sort of graph, and unfortunately, 
won't take it much further today. But each of these symbols is a fishery for a particular aggregating species, uh, and, the, and I've grouped them by uh, family on the, in this graph. And what we can see quite clearly is the groupers are emerging. Um, they have high intrinsic vulnerability uh, generally, and they can be very exposed to aggregation fishing because of these density changes that are occurring are quite large. But you still see that there are some groupers that are quite low in intrinsic value, uh, intrinsic vulnerability, either because they are uh, not particularly forming large aggregations or because they've got slightly faster uh, rates of population increase and so on. So you're getting some groupers there, and I'm not going to tell you what that for sure is. You can ask me afterwards. Um, and but what you find is so these would typically be scoring very high vulnerability because of their position in the graph. And then you've obviously got moderate vulnerability. Uh, and again, you're getting a lots of groupers in that uh, level because of their intrinsic vulnerability. Plus also some of the uh, sea bream species that are occurring up there. But what you're finding is that the rabbit fish um, down here, very, very low intrinsic vulnerability. They have a very, very fast turnover in the population, high growth rates. They aggregate for very short periods of a time, not for very long. And the density changes or the, the, the changes in vulnerability, as you saw, were not that great for these rabbit fish. So it's not really the aggregation fishing which is driving vulnerability. But what we see is that they're under, in Kenya and Seychelles, under quite high fishing pressure, which is why they're far up on their nets. And then, of course, really, you want your fishery to be there, but you can't depend on uh, intrinsic vulnerability, obviously. So the next steps for this analysis, obviously, uh, there's a need to weight these indicators in terms of their relative importance. And I'm going around now and asking other people at the center here to help me wait those. So if anyone wants to do a 20 minute interview with me in the next few days to wait some indicators, please let me know. Um, and then it's also for each of these fisheries, we're trying to find either stock assessment uh, results or reports or uh, anecdotal evidence of the status of those aggregations to see whether the position or the Euclidean distance is in any way a predictive of the status of that fishery or that aggregation. So that's the next uh, step in the analysis. And as well as looking at the static sort of position, we also look, we also ask experts about the future directions of the fisheries, whether they were half, half, sort of glass half full or half glass empty, uh, and whether they actually thought there was more pressure coming into the fishery, uh, whether they were you know, optimistic about the future or not. And also this kind of system is useful for exploring drivers. Globally, what are the main factors that are driving spawning aggregation fisheries? <laughs> so my PhD research aims to understand the causes of vulnerability uh, in these uh, aggregated species. We find that an increase in density does predispose vulnerability, but the actual, mort oh, sorry, the actual mortality will depend on ultimately on the catchability and the fishing effort, and catchability as influenced by things like technology, accessibility, and fisher knowledge. We find that this catchability, uh, I found, is modified by fisher knowledge behavior and access to gears or habitat, the selectivity of the gears, the density of fishers at spawning aggregations, the environment, uh, so other aggregated species or currents. So clearly, catchability is dynamic, and it can result in unintended management outcomes, as we saw with uh, fishing effort controls and hyperstability. There is a need, therefore, to quantify some of these key fishery parameters and understand their effects for assessment and management. Um, even in the case of uh, marine reserves, which many people advocate being data poor, but are very sensitive to what's going on with catchability for these species. So just a few perspectives. Um, the graph on the bottom is very small, but it's basically a global capture of groupers uh, from 1950 to 2009, showing that demand is growing for many of these groupers um, that I've been talking about today. <laughs> but importantly, I think there needs to be a bit of a change in the conservation and management model. Um, some work going on in parallel, so my PhD is looking at the, the role of stock recruitment relationships and finding that really what you need to do is you need to, do, to protect all the spawning sites and not just focus your MPAs on one or two, because you can still lose those aggregations even if they're protected if you're losing other spawning sites because of the way the stock recruitment relationships are interconnected. So in a way, it's better to manage fishing across all spawning sites than protect with NPAs or other things, just a few. And you also need to manage the fishery in non-spawning periods. So for the rabbit fish, 
they're not particularly vulnerable to uh, spawning aggregation fishing, um, but they are vulnerable to the capture of juveniles in non-spawning habitat, as I show in some of the other uh, work that I've been doing in parallel. So the PhD identifies key parameters and develops tools that can support a new management approach. In terms of thesis publications, there are uh, um, so three that are published. There are uh, there's one that's submitted to ecological applications, and the last one relating to the last chapter is still in, is still in prep. Uh, in addition to those, I've also uh, produced another five publications specifically on spawning aggregations um, during the last few years, um, and then some publications not on spawning aggregations, still on coral reefs and fish and stuff. So those ones there. Um, so, and, and I presented at um, two symposiums, uh, work from my PhD, and also at a Blue Economy Summit in Abu Dhabi. Uh, I've also been appointed director of the Society for Conservation of Reef Fish Aggregations and uh, vice chair of the Scientific Committee of Tuna Commission, which also deals with aggregations of tuna. Um, and I've continued to advise uh, government and Seychelles on various initiatives. Um, just, uh, okay, so I'd just like to make my acknowledgements, obviously, to Fiona, my wife, and, and two children, Estelle and Xavier in Seychelles, who couldn't be with us today. No. It's 7am, it's a chance. Which means they're late for school. <laughs> and my mum and dad. And obviously all the fishers that I worked with in PNG and Seychelles. The Nature Conservancy who supported work in uh, PNG uh, and Society for Conservation of Reef Fish Aggregations. And then people who have helped uh, either as co-authors um, you know, or have particularly been useful for giving me good advice um, and referees and so on. And I'd like to thank Nick and Josh, my supervisors, not just for the supervision, uh, which has been pretty good, uh, but also for letting us let stay in the back cave and the retreat, uh, the Shrine retreat, and uh, also to Glenn, who unfortunately can't be with us today and passed away this year, um, who was really helpful on uh, basically the setting up the PhD and on some of the work in PNG, and then funders. Thank you. <laughs>